Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my one esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez. No Jerry today, sadly. Um, but today we are interviewing the amazing Samson Mao, uh, CEO and founder of gaming company Pixelmatic and CSO of Blockstream. Uh, very short intro there, but how are you doing, Samson? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Awesome. Well, we are honored to have you uh, have you here. So, yeah, as per usual, we'll just uh, dig straight in, basically, getting to know you. But is there is there anything you want to introduce to uh, the audience about yourself, or are you happy with the introduction I gave? Just first off, I don't want to. I'm I'm happy with it. I'm just a, a Bitcoiner, someone that loves Bitcoin and thinks Bitcoin is great. That's it. Sounds great. Well, just like the rest of us, basically. Um, okay. Well, yeah. I mean. What I usually do to start off our conversation is just kind of uh, go back kind of to the uh, the earlier days, right, in, in your life and try and get an idea of who you are, uh, what makes you tick, et cetera. So um, I saw when I was looking into you further um, that you you essentially, I guess we'll start from after uni because uh, that makes kind of a lot of sense. I feel like a lot, a lot of time we don't really start our lives to work 18-ish anyway. Um, so you got your degree. You worked at Relic Entertainment then BTC China, then Ubisoft, I think. I might maybe wrong there. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Relic, then Sitemasher, then Ubisoft, and then BTC China and Pixelmatic at the same time. Oh, yeah, more or less the same time. Gotcha. Okay. So, well, <laughs> there's a lot going on there, like kind of as, as you've uh, made clear. Um, so you've kind of, uh, yeah, bounced around between uh, crypto gaming and kind of juggled two at the same time as well, obviously with working at Blockstream and Pixelmatic right now. Um, I guess the first question, um, when it comes into like working in gaming in the, in the uh, earlier times to, than now, like Relic and, and Ubisoft, like what was it like working at those companies? Um, and especially compared to what you're doing now with running your own uh, gaming company? Well, I think uh, working at both of those companies, there's a lot more... Um... Uh, structure and bureaucracy, I guess, to put it in a, a nice way. Um, being able to uh, run my own company like Pixelmatic, there's a lot more freedom in terms of what you can do creatively and just in terms of innovation, raw innovation. So we are able to do a lot of cool things that I think a traditional game company would not do, like replacing their game currency with a crypto token or making uh, assets in the game NFTs. I think there's a, a lot of traditional thinking in the game industry, and there's not that much uh, willingness to explore and change things. Um, even not touching the crypto stuff, uh, we're doing a lot of innovative stuff on the game side too. Like we're rolling out a directed narrative. This is basically a game story where you are writing the story. It's not pre-scripted. There's no um, quest that you go out and kill 10 things and collect 10 pelts or something boring like that. Uh, but it's just a, a way that we plan to operate the game where it's a, a blank slate. There is a story, but it's you, the players that are driving that story in a way. I don't know if you guys play Dungeons and Dragons, but it's kind of like we are the, the dungeon master and we're crafting that story just for you guys. Um, but yeah, like uh, Relic and Ubisoft, they're very big companies. They're very much uh, ingrained in making franchise releases, you know, like... Uh, Company Heroes 1, 2, Dawn of War 1, 2, 3, and then for us, uh, Ubisoft, Assassin's Creed, you know, they're just cranking out those franchises where we're trying to build something totally new and never done before. Yeah, it definitely seems like kind of different um, focuses, as you say, like with them just cranking out the same things that kind of sell, they've got no known names anyway, and you can kind of innovate more. Um, it's a cool idea, like the whole like narrative, because I, I always like remember playing... Um, like not uh, not Skyrim. What was one before Skyrim? I can't remember now. Oh, it's gonna wind me up. But anyway, I used to play uh, Skyrim and its pre predecessor and Fallout Three and all these things for, for so long. I always loved that you kind of pick a storyline, but it wasn't really you know fully. But for that for that then it was quite cool. Um, and I always wondered like what would happen if you could kind of just pick you know hundreds of different storylines at different points rather than just one or the other or maybe three. Um, so it sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, Mass Effect tried to do that too. I guess you're a gamer, but you know they tried to let you choose your your story, right? But the outcome is the same. So even if you picked like from one, two, and three, uh, at the end it's still the same ending, which is not very interesting in my view. Um, ours is more open ended. It's kind of a cross between, I guess, that kind of a thing and a sandbox. So 
will kind of go in the direction that the players want to go in and we'll explore that direction. But if they like meet some other objective on the board, then we'll start panning out the story in that other direction. I love it. It sounds, uh, sounds good. I uh, definitely interested myself. Uh, yeah, I used to used to be a big gamer, less so these days because I spend more time messing around with Bitcoin, but uh, I still still do occasionally. Um, I guess like uh, to kind of switch the conversation a little bit into the crypto direction, I'm probably going to find myself flopping back and forth quite a lot. But um, so obviously you, you've discussed, well, you came across Bitcoin, obviously, um, and then you ended up working in the, the industry. So you see China and Blockstream. What, um, I guess, because obviously you're, you're working in the gaming side of things. What was it that made you decide to kind of make this, not necessarily switch, but, you know, this decision to go, I'm going to actually work in Bitcoin and, and take that extra step to get involved in the industry and, and kind of make a difference? What was it that kind of clicked for you when maybe when you discovered Bitcoin or what was it that made you make that decision? Because it's quite a big leap if you're already successfully in the gaming industry. So what was it that kind of made you make that change? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So when I first discovered Bitcoin, that was while I was... Um... I just started up Pixelmatic. I think I read about it in 2013, which was kind of late still by, by standards, uh, but for OGs. But um, I read about Bitcoin mining and that just kind of triggered, um, really triggered my interest in it because I had heard about it before that, but more tangentially, like, you know, Bitcoin's used for buying drugs or whatever. But when I read about the mining, that's when it was um, really keyed in that this is very unique because it is decentralized that, um, it's not just money controlled by one party, but anyone can participate, uh, mine Bitcoin and secure the network. And there's just no barrier. So for me, that was really what uh, was the aha moment where I thought, okay, this is really novel and interesting. And when the opportunity came up to be a part of BTC China, I just thought, okay, well, I probably should take that opportunity and, and uh, get more involved in it. And uh, from there, the rest is history. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like NFTs and crack jokes about them and stuff. But you mentioned in, in your gaming company that you see a role for them, like in the future of gaming. Um, do you see like Lightning being integrated or do you see um, it being more like each game will have their own kind of virtual currency? Well, I think there is a way to use Lightning. So uh, we're heavily using the Liquid Network for all of our blockchain tech in, in Infinite Fleet. So the game currency is a liquid asset. Um, in Liquid, uh, we can talk about Liquid more in a bit, but uh, Liquid has stable coins. It's got uh, other games that are building on it, like Light Knight. Um, it's got uh, NFTs, like uh, we launched Rare Toshi. It's an art website focused on Bitcoin-related art that is making NFTs on Liquid. Uh, but you can pr pretty much do anything on Liquid. So we're using that to issue our game currency. And we're also using that, that to do the NFTs for the ships. But there is a purpose here. Um, I think you could argue that games are a stronger use case for NFTs than just artwork, right? Um, and art NFT is more like a certificate. And there are use cases like enforcing royalties on it. But for a game, what we hope to do is uh, allow players to do atomic swaps. So you can basically trade in the marketplace and every trade is actually an atomic swap. So if I'm trading with you, Ricardo, um, I have INF currency and you have a ship that I want, then when we do that trade, it's a trustless exchange. So it's either executed all at once or not at all. And this can prevent a lot of things like scamming. So if you even decide to not use our marketplace, but just like, you know, move your INF to an external wallet, like um, I don't know, side swap and move your ships to side swap, then you can actually use side swap to swap too. Um, and you're not reliant on one provider, right? So it's kind of facilitating that um, disintermediation where there's no single point of failure because all of these assets are now tradable on the liquid chain. And I think the, the benefit here is that really it facilitates that trustless trade, but also you can have new dynamics. So if you played like a lot of MMO games with guilds, you know that people will try to infiltrate a guild and get access to the guild bank, right? And then they'll, they'll loot the bank. Then there's a famous instance of this happening in EVE Online. But with the INF as the game currency and as a crypto token, you could set up a multi-sig wallet with the, the, the guild treasury members, right? And then no one can loot the guild. So there's a lot more interesting things that are possible now. And this opens up... Uh, a lot more of that to discovery by players. And it's interesting to see what they will do with it.
That's pretty cool. Because you mentioned the uh, liquid sidechain and um, obviously that's something that Blockstream has like a big part in um, uh, from my understanding anyway. I mean, I, I know a lot more about the Lightning Network than I do the liquid uh, chain. Obviously, I like the basics, but it'd be cool if for people uh, listening, if you could kind of give like a, a sort of nice summary overview of, of what it is, how it works. Um, I think I'm sure people will be interested to hear from yourself. So liquid is a Bitcoin sidechain. So it- a sidechain is really a blockchain without a native currency. It's anchored to another chain. So for Liquid, we're anchored to Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of blockchains out there, you know, and they all have their own native, native currency that they either sold through an ICO or some form or fashion. But Liquid, the native currency is Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin locked up on the Bitcoin chain and unlocked in Liquid. So you have LBTC. And LBTC is what you use to pay for fees in the network. And of course, you can use it to transport liquid Bitcoin itself very rapidly between exchanges. So if someone wanted to move uh, funds from Bitfinex to BitRefill, they could use liquid. Once BitRefill supports liquid, then that would be uh, about one minute to confirm that transaction because we have one minute blocks. You also have the added benefit of privacy because Liquid has confidential assets and confidential transactions. So when you're sending from Bitfinex to BitRefill, that is not a a transaction that can be monitored and tracked. Um, You can also do it with stable coins too. So you could send USDT to pay a BitRefill invoice as well. Um, And we've also done some work to kind of integrate the two things, Liquid and Lightning. So you can actually have a Lightning network spun up on top of a Liquid asset. So if you think of Bitcoin as having only one asset type, which is Bitcoin, uh, we have uh, liquid Bitcoin and we have USDT, uh, Canadian dollar stablecoin, Japanese yen stablecoin, and also game currencies like INF. But each one of those things, if there's enough liquidity, they can each have their own lightning network. So then you would enable free and instantaneous transactions for any liquid asset, so long as people have it and you can route through the network. So I think I missed talking about that on your earlier question, but that's the kind of follow up too. But um, for a game currency that's using liquid, you can also have a lightning network. So right now the model is, um, we probably do similar to a a mining pool payout. So um, you'll get batch transactions after you earn INF uh, because INF is earned, not bought, but you'll get that once a day or something like that. But if we have uh, lightning support for liquid assets, then we could stream those to you over an INF lightning network. So that's where things get really cool. You have uh, frictionless, free moving, uh, cheap transactions. How does Elements differ from Liquid? So Elements is the fork of Bitcoin. Liquid is the, I guess the branded version of it. The first the, the first live production network based off of Elements. So Elements is just the, the code base. And then Liquid is the, the product. You could say that. So I guess like, um... Because obviously, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think what situations, what like in what situations you'd want to choose. I guess you don't have to go Lightning versus Liquid, as you've kind of said already. You can have Liquid um, uh, the side chain with like tokens, etc., like LBTC that you then uh, use on the Lightning network as well. Um, but I guess like if you were trying to say one or the other, um, I guess what what situations? I, I imagine there's some element of centralization to the Liquid side chain. Uh, is that is that correct? Or I, I'd guess so, right? Like. Uh, yeah. People argue Lightning's slightly centralized as well. Um, so I suppose there's, there's going to be elements of it compared to the, well, to the main layer. Nothing is as decentralized as Bitcoin main layer, layer one. Um, there's trade-offs to get to layer two, but there's also benefits that come with those trade-offs. And I like to say you should use the right tool for the right job. If you're transacting large amounts, like Liquid was originally launched for facilitation of exchange to exchange transfers, like saying moving from uh, Bitfinex to OKX to uh, BitMEX or something like that, where you're sending like 20, 30 uh, liquid Bitcoins, right? Uh, and that is something you can't really do on Lightning because you need to route. Lightning is better suited for small payments. And of course, the threshold is increasing as the, the Bitcoin price is moving up, right? We can route bigger and bigger payments in dollar terms. But still, like you, you'll never be able to route you know, hundreds of Bitcoin through the Lightning network. And it may not make sense either because lightning is essentially, uh, uh, lightning wallets are hot wallets. Whereas for liquid, you can have hot, warm and cold wallets, just the same as any exchange uh, infrastructure, right? I can receive the liquid Bitcoin, move it to cold storage, move it out when I need to uh, send to users or whatnot. But 
there it, it's more akin to the standard model where the exchanges are used to um, storing their coins in different um, varying degrees of security uh, and isolation. So, you know, Lightning is great, and Lightning and Liquid would probably probably be even better um, because uh, there are benefits to having Lightning networks on top of Liquid because the block times are every minute, and the fees are lower, and um, channel closes will be more predictable. So I think it's a kind of a, a, a both of them will be used in the future. It's just a, a matter of when, not really if. And I think wallets will end up supporting, um, you know, main chain, uh, lightning on main chain, and then liquid, and then lightning on liquid assets. And then we can probably handle a lot of uh, channel rebalancing and things like that and make that more automated for end users so that for them, using Bitcoin is just a, a seamless experience without any hassles or complexity. If we had like 20 different assets on Liquid and they all have their own Lightning network, are they able to do like atomic swaps between each Lightning network for each asset? Yeah, I think um, there has been some experimentation with that. I, uh, I think Litecoin had a Lightning network at some point too. And they did some um, swaps between the two Lightning networks. But I think it's totally possible to do that if there's enough... Uh, users and liquidity for each network. Okay, so I, I guess, yeah, I understand. It feels like to me, uh, the the I guess the overall aim or the perfect future would be, as you say, so the, that you'd have a wallet that accepts all like Lightning, Liquid, Main Chain, maybe other stuff, who knows? Um, but yeah, you'd kind of use your 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 Lightning for your you know, your Starbucks or whatever, your coffee in the morning. Um, your your Main Chain and, and, and Liquid would kind of be either for more retail investors or just your bigger moves, basically. Um, or even uh, kind of, as you said, like experimenting with different things. So there's obviously, there's the NFT space. So I saw like, I think it was uh, the first I saw uh, the use of Red Toshi was um, Vlad Kostea has like his um, magazine he's done and he's been using it. And I thought it was a pretty cool um, idea um, to do that. Uh, when I first saw you doing an FT, I thought, wait, what? Like a Bitcoin guy that I spoke to is doing it. I was, I was, like, I was really like taken aback at first. And then I realized, okay, and it's not on like Ethereum or Solana or something. It's on uh, the Bitcoin side chain, which, which makes more sense. Yeah. Um, if you look at like the reasons why I think Bitcoiners don't like NFTs, I think a large part of it has to do with Ethereum poisoning the well. Like the, the NFTs on Ethereum are just so scammy and, and ridiculous that it just makes you laugh at the entire concept. Um, whereas if you look at Ritoshi, it's more like a community. It's artists posting their Bitcoin art. It's not copy paste uh, or ripped from the internet or it's not stupid like a, a rock. You know, <laughs> There's actually some, some art in it. And I think uh, we built up a healthy ecosystem where you know we have artists listing stuff, we have people buying the art because they want to support the artist. A lot of the art comes with the physical piece as well. So the NFT is like a, a certificate of ownership for your physical piece. I bought um, a piece called uh, Adam Back from Cypherpunk Now, and it's the 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 line is called the Cypherpunks of the World. And I think my piece is coming soon, but you know it's pretty cool that I have the NFT and I have the physical art as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's exactly something that Lab was doing. And I think you're right with the NFT space. It's one of the things when I first heard about it, I don't know, it must have been ages ago. I think I had an NFT without realizing it back in like 2019, 18 or something. I had some like random things I'd got for PP, but uh, that was years ago. But um, I, when I first heard about it and actually understood what was going on, must have been in... I don't know, uh, 2020 sometime. Um, I, I, immediately, I thought, well, a great idea. You know, you can do like uh, artists can actually get back for the for the first time ever in history. Probably they can actually start getting paid while they're alive, at least. Um, and you know, things like music potentially. You can have like you can own the first copy of a song by an artist or whatever. But um, then it's things like you see uh, there's these like crypto punks or whatever they were called on, on ethereum and then someone just created an exact copy of each one on solana and was like you know we're just gonna and people were outraged and they were like oh we're gonna go do a copyright battle and everything it's like you don't own the drawing just because you have the nft you know and it kind of ex exposed that issue so i think i like the idea of what you're doing with like creating like a smaller community that's going to grow more naturally and not just for the sake of making money but more for like hey this is good art i'm going to support it it's a certificate so i think it's a pretty pretty cool idea mm -hmm.